Brandon Davis, Swan Energy. Imran Khan, Swan Energy. Thank you, Mr. Brandon Davis, Mr. Emron Khan, Swan Energy, for joining the program here today. We're trying out a kind of a new segment. So much of the economy has to deal with energy. Of course, energy is under the mining sec- sector, uh, oil and gas, coal, gold, silver, palladium, the different mining that's in sil- you know, silver, I mentioned, all kinds of different mining involved. So we're doing like a money and mining segment. And first person I thought of, Brandon Davis, who's been on the show multiple times, and he's got a uh, fingers in a lot of different areas, mining particularly. And they're currently buying some natural gas leases. We interviewed uh, some people earlier in the week on that. Jeremy, I think, Jeremy it was. Yeah, that's right. I had to make sure I had my name right there. And then um, also with money, he does a lot of investing. He's brought in Emron Khan, who I have not met yet, but this will be interesting because, uh, gentlemen, how are you doing today, by the way? Doing great. We're very, very well today. Thank you. How about you, Emron? I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. Well, good. And thank you both for joining us today because, you know, people are really figuring out what's going on. They're trying to figure out what's going on. And one of the conversations we've been having is the energy industry really should be a leader right now in the economy. And the reason I say that is because the oil and gas industry especially is used to the volatile marketplace. They're used to boom bust cycles. You know, the restaurant industry has never really experienced like the, the COVID-19 shutdown and a lot of other industry has have not as either, but the energy industry has, especially the oil and gas industry. Uh, I was looking at a Houston Chronicle article where it says oil and gas facing its own energy apocalypse. And I thought, boy, we're getting into sensationalism here with the Houston Chronicle. I better get to the bottom of this. So, gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. Let's talk a little bit about a little bit of money and mining. Start with the oil and gas world. Of course, the crude life. We've got a very big oil and gas audience and how are your guys' businesses doing? And, and what do you think about the energy apocalypse? That's hilarious. Huh. Yeah, that, that is funny. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, so what, what did you call 20, 20 uh, was it 14, 15, 16? That was the downturn. Was oh, okay. Remember? So that was the downturn. This is the apocalypse. Well, I, I can tell you this. It, 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 in every downturn that there's ever been, or not that there's ever been an apocalypse, that's a, that's a big word. That's a big word, but we adapt, make it work, have to. Well, I think a lot of these guys are, are referring to, you know, oil, you, you know, looking like it hit negatives a few months ago and, and, and taking advantage of the fact that, you know, it, it seems like there's a negative connotation around that. But if you look at where we're at, I mean, we're really not that far from, you know, where we were before. And yeah, the volatility is there, but, you know, that's oil and gas, right? Well, exactly. And that's one of the reasons why I'm glad you guys are joining me today, because not a lot of people have the leadership qualities to step up and have this type of conversation, because so many people are trying to do the herd mentality and follow what's going on in the media. But if they're using words like energy apocalypse, I remember back in 2014 and 15 during the downturn, I did an article that said, boy, we're at $35 oil in the Bakken and is still pumping out a million barrels a day. Okay, I don't understand where the downturn is coming from. And so it's really different when the media can present a false narrative or just really, um, I hate to say the word false narrative, but no, it really is. Uh, Your guys' thoughts on how the media plays into what's going on with, with kind of the money and management when it comes to the energy sector. I stopped watching TV on March 15th. And I have not watched it since. And I quit reading the news about the same time because it was all the same every day and ridiculous. So I don't have a lot to say about that. Imran may because he, he does a lot more reading than I do. But, um, it, it, you know, I think it's it's horrible how everything and not just that statement and mm-hmm. an, an article you're speaking about from the Houston Chronicle on oil and gas. But everything, everything is up 100. Per, it's all the way up or all the way down. There's no in between. And it's very um, hard to. You know, gauge anything based on those pieces of information because it's extremely biased one direction or the other. It's, there's not. It's really hard to find a neutral 
piece of news, period. And that, that's my take on it. Uh, Emron, I'm going to jump in here for just a second because uh, I want you to answer the question as well, but I wanted to throw this in there. Uh, as a member of the media, one of the things that I've had trouble with and keep in mind, I've, I've won multiple awards for my journalism past, and so this is something I am qualified to speak on. The media has gone almost the way of, uh, of uh, game day, sports center, where you've got a lot of people that are playing a theatrical role in suits, and they're starting to speculate the news instead of reporting the news. And I find that very dangerous when you are talking about a mining industry which makes its money through speculation. So now if you've got the, a, a trusted eyes and ears for the people getting into the speculation business uh, as opposed to the reporting business, uh, that makes it very difficult for the average person to trust the traditional media when it comes to these types of issues. Uh, Emron, your thought on that very layered, heavy topic I just presented you. Yeah, you know, honestly, you know, I, and, and by the way, I'm, uh, you know, I really do appreciate the uh, the work that you do and you know in general uh media as a whole but you know let, let's really be factual about things right i mean what's really fun to hear right i mean stating actual facts about what's going on and actually you know quoting the the different uh entities that are out there that are that are giving you good data or throwing words around like apocalypse i mean you know the latter is what people are more you know they enjoy hearing more right so i think that's part of the why part of the reason why you're you're, you're seeing a lot of these types of uh situations happening out there it just it's it's good news at the end of the day and um you know fr from our point of view though i mean it's great because it, it gives us opportunities to be able to buy at better prices well, i think i don't think people necessarily like that word but that's grabbing their attention to watch exactly. or read or whatever it is you know i look at it like this but the way you explained it just now there's a company that I've, I've bought and sold a few shares of here and there that trades futures. And they're, they're, so it's a future, they're trading oil futures and they're on the um, stock exchange and you can buy options on their trading. So basically you can, you can buy an option. So basically you're taking 500 times more risk, uh, but you have 500 times more upside. Um, same as the news. I mean, it's, it's literally, it, they're, they're trading, they're trading options on options, and it's extremely volatile and high risk. And that it's it's high risk because people are going to love them or hate them. And I think that the way it's kind of gone over the last five years is that's very very differentiated from what it was, um, where you had a bunch of neutral news and organizations and a couple of outliers on both ends. And now there is really not any neutral ones. They're all one side or the other, and it's crazy. I, I've never seen anything like it. But the beautiful part about this economy, this country, and the people that actually work, um, we adapt and make whatever we have to out of the situation that we're given. You know, I, I've watched these businesses in Houston um, as this COVID situation happened, and they got shut down, and, and the ones that reopen and quickly adapt to the situation where they're selling toilet paper at restaurants – I'm just saying, and doing delivery for free and doing whatever they can to keep their business moving. It's it's the same exact thing we do in the oil business whenever prices go down. We figure out a way to make it work at a lower price. The same exact thing. And and that's not ever going to change. And it was the apocalypse or not, I, I, I don't see it dying. Um, I've heard people talk about BP getting out of the oil business and, and moving in towards a banking angle and saying oil and gas is dead I'm like no it's just it's just riskier than banking <laughs> so <laughs> it's really really simple um but anyway i i'm i'm off sub off topic a little bit but you get you get my opinion on that it's it's ridiculous and absurd well i think you actually you're bringing up a great point which is reinvention which is adaption which is you know, even if you want to get biblical, uh, you know, humans are meant to be wanderers. So when it comes to the economy, you got to wander around at times. So there's a lot of different signs that say you need to change if you want to be relevant in today's economy. I mean, they got 3D printers that are printing homes now. I mean, come on. When we reset this economy, you're not telling me that these 3D printer homes aren't going to put out a lot of little small businesses. So there's a very interesting dynamic that's happening. And I think adaption and change is really 
important right now. And one of the reasons I wanted to bring you guys on was to talk about this energy apocalypse. And I, you know, the, what they were talking about is basically that, uh, you know, there's just a lot of people that are affected by the shut-ins. And that is true. I mean, there's uh, sand, uh, frac sand guys, saltwater people cleaning. Absolutely, there's a lot of people affected by the shut-ins. However, as we mentioned before we got on the air, they just printed $7 trillion more dollars. So there is more money out in, in the marketplace. Now, the, a lot of the banks have it, and they got it first, but it's still going to trickle down eventually. So get out there and go get it. Uh, how are your guys' businesses? I know I know you've got some trucking. I know you got in the mining sector with the gold, and gold uh, natural gas leases you guys are currently buying. Just kind of give us a rundown a little bit of some reality that's going on with the different sectors that you guys oversee. Well, I, I want to first say that the, the, the wells being shut in is affecting everyone in the industry, and it's what's helping the price come up, which is a good thing for everybody. Um, so for the for whatever negative it created, I, I can assure you, based on what I've watched over the last month with oil price, it's definitely got more upside than down overall. Um, but on the other side of that, um, I do have a gold mine, and um, I must say that once you find oil, it's not that hard to get it produced, and you can talk to, you know, in Houston here, hell, we could walk through the building and probably talk to 10 guys that could help us figure out what to do with a well that we can't get to produce. But I can tell you, gold mining, on the other hand, is much more difficult because it's a lot less regular um, and a lot less consistent. And right now, with the economy doing what it's doing, the $7 trillion you just mentioned, uh, my gold mine is actually for sale because it is prime time to sell it. The, uh, everything I've read about mining and, and gold, it, it's definitely going up, and that gives me a reason to get out. <laughs> and we'll see what happens with that. I don't know what you have to add. No, that, that's actually a really good point, Brandon. And, you know, from that standpoint, as you mentioned, Jason, the $7 trillion being put in, you know, what do people do, right? I mean, like when you have uh, – in a sense, the opportunity for some type of inflation occurring, what do people go into? Right? I mean, they go into minerals, they go into other resources, gold, silver. Uh, you know, I was having a conversation just yesterday about this uh, with a person, and, and they were talking about how they're moving a lot of their portfolio into those spaces. Um, and it, it makes sense, right? I mean, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, the, the whole idea of making lemonade out of lemons, right? I mean, people always kind of... You know, you, you got to go with where you're at. I mean, all this COVID items that have been going on for the last few months, you know, people are looking for, oh, well, when are things going to become normal again? I mean, this is a normal now. Yep. I mean, there's not, you know, COVID is not going away. Um, you know, where we're working on things, we're working, when we're looking at deals, you know, I'm looking at pricing things at today's pricing. So when we're looking at deals, we're getting st strip prices that are a lot lower and we're using that. Our engineers are going through and evaluating things at a much lower number. And, you know, people are selling at those numbers because sometimes they're over leveraged. Sometimes they have other other things that are making them more money. But, you know, deals are still happening at the end of the day. I think that's really a big thing to kind of understand and move forward with. Uh, if you're, if you're going to, I guess, sit there and wait, you know, when are you going to wait till, right? It's better to average up or down in any business, right? To where you're always having some sort of deal flow rather than just sitting there and, you know, waiting for that quote unquote opportunity. Wanted to ask you guys about the renewable market. Uh, one of the things that I've, I, I like about what Swan Energy is doing is positioning themselves with natural gas. Natural gas is not a bridge fuel, it's foundation fuel for the next. 20, 30, 40 years at least. And I understand there's going to be a transition from uh, coal and crude oil uh, to wind and solar. That's That's been going on since Al Gore put out the movie. And uh, in Inconvenient Truth, that's about when they ramped up that. And I'm just kind of doing a quick pass on Google right now and Goldman Sachs and BP. And you're looking at all these big guys that are, are going the way of um, renewables, but they can't do renewables without fossil fuelables. You know, I mean, I'm looking at uh, Germany firing up coal plants and, and India is start, or China, I just read, is adding new coal plants now. They're building coal plants out there in China. So it's a different dynamic that's going on with the renewable push 
through the finance sector, but the reality is they still need these fossil fuels. And natural gas just seems to be like, like I said, the foundation fuel as opposed to the bridge fuel. Curious on your guys' thoughts on the on the renewable transition, the renewable push, and even how that's affected the banking sector. Yeah, actually, really good question there. And, and um, you know, honestly, like the, the way that I look at it, you know, first of all, there there's a lot of stuff going on from a standpoint of, you know, using renewables to be able to reduce emissions. And I think that's great. Um, you know, you, you, you saw you see all these companies going more focus on natural gas. And, you know, again, that's just another product from an oil and gas perspective anyways. Um, I know from a, uh, a lot of these companies these days from a, uh, from a standpoint of the Paris Agreement, they're trying to reduce their carbon footprint by 50% by, I think, 2050 or something to that effect. I don't quote me on that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's something like that. And, you know, companies like Equinor, companies like Shell, they're, they're agreeing to be able to do that. But really, um, Jason, if you think about what's really happening, right, you, you have to kind of think through, I think the, the, the two points you made earlier with China and India and, and going into uh, coal is a big part of it. You know, if you think about your pie uh, being a smaller pie and it being 80, 90 percent oil, right? And then, you know, in 5, 10, 15, 20 years, your pie becomes a lot bigger because a lot more different countries, different continents even might be coming on board uh, that need more more energy than than what's out there right now. How do you grow that? Right. Do you get rid of natural gas? Do you get rid of oil? No, you add to it. You add the other other. Uh, renewables along with it so you have to add solar you have to add uh, the wind farms and that's how you kind of complete that that full package of energy right I don't think that is going away it's basically you know you're you're adapting and, and you're growing other sectors along with it because of the, the, the requirement of more energy this